would like to now have Emily come up and move. Welcome. We're glad to have you, and she will give us her credit. <laughs> So yeah, being a veterinarian, the most of what I work with is animals. You draw what you know. Uh, so, you know, I kind of brought examples, but I wanted to talk mostly about shrink plastic. Because it's, if you remember shrinky dinks, you know, when, you, yeah, everybody's nodding their heads. <laughs> they actually decided to just go, okay, let's just make a sanded piece of plastic and see what people do with it. It is really a lot of fun. So I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, yeah, most of my work, I do pet portraits, um, fantasy artwork using you know, animals with human characteristics. Celtic, I really like Celtic and Irish knotwork, so I tend to blend that in as often as I can. Um, so I do a lot of that type of thing. And then the shrink plastic. So like I said, it's like shrinky dinks. Uh, and I actually, I brought some, I can pass this stuff around because it's kind of neat. So this is what it is. It is just a sanded sheet of plastic. One side sanded, the other side smooth. It takes ink, uh, marker, colored pencil is really nice because the, the waxy ones tend to really soak in well. And it takes what you do in the big size. When it shrinks down, it makes it look like you've done something really 10 times more awesome than you think you did. <laughs> All the little things, the details, the lines are still there just much smaller. Um, so I brought along, and I'll kind of talk about my process, um, but I can pass that around to you guys and I'll take a look at just what it is uh, and what it starts out as. So you, know, you kind of see the, the three examples I have over there, the flamingo, a fox, and a, a little bee on a flower. Those happen to be my realistic ones because my Celtic ones sold. Uh, <laughs> but I really do like doing Celtic knot work on this type of thing because, of, again, that small ability to shrink things down. And a lot of times what I do really for all of my process, I actually start on tracing paper. You know, a lot of people see me drawing on and they're like, oh, you're just tracing. It lets me actually take that image and I can flip it upside down and back and forth. So instead of having to take a picture or hold it up to a mirror, I can visually flip it back and forth to make sure that I'm getting the anatomy right, getting the designs right. Because after you stare at it one way for so long, you just start thinking, oh, that looks great, until you flip it over and it's like, okay, one eyeball is up here and the other one's down here and you know, the face is <laughs> all of those type of things. So you know, doing it on tracing paper, you know, for my pet portraits, for my fantasy artwork, for really anything I do, I start on tracing paper. And the other reason I start on tracing paper, the, the little circle designs that I do, uh, I've started doing more and more of those because they're fun to do. Uh, but it lets me start, this is my cheat sheet for those. It's just a little three divided piece of circle. So I can take that and my tracing paper, and then I just have to draw one. So I can see how I want it to go in there, get them to fit and, and match up, and line everything up that way. Then I can take this single piece, you know, my, my third, I scan it into the computer, and then I use my computer to rotate it around and make, I'm stretching over myself there, but do kind of the finished design-ish. From here, if, I, you know, if there's some knots that I really don't like or things that I don't like how they overlap, I'll go back, back to the tracing paper, I'll redraw it. I may redraw some of these four, five, ten times as I kind of go back and forth deciding just how I want it to look. But once I decide how I want it to look, one of two things, if I'm doing the, the circle pieces, I usually use transfer paper, unless it's a thin enough paper then I have a, a little thin light board that I love because it's like a quarter of an inch wide and it just runs off a little battery pack so I can take it anywhere I need to go in front of the TV usually <laughs> and use that to transfer the paper or you know like I said using transfer paper itself. For the shrink plastic though because of how you know as it comes along you'll see but because of how translucent it is 
I did a decent job of planning ahead. I actually made sure I had pieces to show. Uh, it shows up behind the plastic. So I can just redraw it right over the plastic. Then, with that plastic, usually I use colored pencil. Like I said, it, it really sucks into the plastic really well. It doesn't tend to move after that, so it's not, you know, you think you heat it up and then it runs around. No, it really doesn't. It just stays right there and gets smaller. Um, so the other nice part is because this is plastic, it doesn't take a lot of layers, though. So you have to think ahead to what colors you want. You can't, blending and some of those things just don't work well. You don't get the chance to do a lot of that. I've tried different methods, and I'm still kind of experimenting on how to get blending and some of the things, the, the flowers that I did here. You know, I tried to use a little bit of different technique to kind of make the background a little more blurry because when you're working on this, blurry is hard. Every little pencil line becomes sharp. So it's, it's tough to get blurry. <laughs> but so then I, I'll do all the plastic. I usually actually have two sheets of paper when I'm doing this. Because it is so translucent, it is sometimes hard to see. You know, if I'm working in a light color, okay, did I actually color all of that in? Or does it just look like I did? So I'll have a light piece and a black piece of paper, and I'll kind of switch them back and forth to make sure that I've actually got it all filled in. Even though it shrinks tiny, you know, all those little lines that it makes more impressive, it makes all the mistakes <laughs> a little tiny and impressive too. <laughs> so they stand out a little more, so making sure I have every little bit filled in. Um, this one, I'll admit, I, you know, when I take it home, I'll shrink it down. Some of the tiny little lines, I'm going to be interested and see how that happens. I've never done one with quite that small of a line. Should work out fine, but haven't tried it. This one I'm intending to actually cut down, you know, once the plastic is ready. You can either cut the plastic itself before you bake it, or you have to use a sander or a grinder afterwards. Because so once it's shrunk, that's how big it'll be. So it, it comes down to a little less than a quarter of its regular size. You know, the sheet I'm passing around says, comes down to half size. No, it's smaller than that. You can stop the baking early, but often I find you wind up with little bubbles or irregularities. So I let it shrink completely. The scariest thing when doing this is watching it in the oven. You both feel like a, you feel like a terrified five-year-old. <laughs> Because as it, as it heats up, the edges will curl. And if you're not watching close enough, they will stick to each other. And then you look at it and you go, dang it, I've got to do that again. <laughs> Which is the other reason I do it on like this, because then I can go back and transfer it again without having to redraw it all on the same time. So, but it is kind of fun to watch, because you, know, you feel like five. You're watching this thing just shrink down, and you know, all the little edges, and I have a little flat spatula. I'll just open the oven and poke it and get the edges to lay back down again. I, it's not that you just can't time it and go away. No, you, you want to watch it. Yeah, if you time it and walk away, that will be the time you come back to a hot dog, where it's just rolled <laughs> itself together. So would it be better to leave the edges uncut? Because those are the things that will curl. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, well, you can cut it. I usually, this is, this is actually a, you know, what I would consider a raw one. I haven't done anything to the edges on this, and I'll pass this one around. This was kind of a, a color experiment I did using more of the traditional Irish colors. And I went, yeah, I don't really like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you'll see the edges... It, well, it starts out nice 90 degree angles. When it curls and cuts down, it is not. So typically I'll take a belt sander and I'll, well, I'll measure out the back and get all the 90 degree angles, put the tape down, and then I use a belt sander. And I go around and I do that or I round the corners. Kind of depends on what I want it to do exactly. I think all of those, yeah, the, the flamingo and the fox have the square corners and the bee. I kind of rounded the corners. Depends on my view. Those are on top of the mats. Yes. Yeah, I have a, a mat backing. And then I use, um, 
trying to remember what they're exactly called. Noobs, nubs, something like that. They're little sticky raised gel things. So it lets me just put it you know, just a little bit kind of floating in there. Um, and typically I will also, because they're translucent, I put a paper on the back. And each one of these actually has a different color. Uh, the bee happens to be black. The fox, I think I put on uh, like an orange color. And I think the flamingo is actually on pink. The color you put behind it will change what it actually looks like and what things pop out the most. So, you know, usually I'll take five different ranges and I just kind of sweep it back and forth until I decide that that's the one I want. Um, but yeah, you, you can't just set it and forget it. <laughs> you kind of watch it. So I'll pass that thing around there. Um, and you can feel how thick it gets. You know, while it shrinks in size, it grows in thickness, which is why you can't really cut it after it's shrunk. You have to use major tools. Um, how long does the Really fast, actually. Maybe 10 minutes at most. Um, you know, Depends a little bit on what your oven's been up to and kind of where it's sitting. I'll admit I don't usually remember to change the tray or the rack. I just turn the oven on and then go, oh, it's way up there. Okay, I'll watch it. <laughs> so the, the closer it is to the heat source, the faster it heats up. The edges will heat first. So sometimes I'll start out and you'll see it kind of curl and there'll be a little flat area in the middle that almost makes a bowl. And then that shrinks down. Um, I actually started playing with this stuff. They have an inkjet printable version. So I was actually taking my artwork, printing it, making it into little pins to sell at some little fandom conventions that I do. And then I found the, the drawing stuff and I was like, ooh, okay, that looks much more fun. <laughs> so the, the inkjet stuff I didn't worry too much about. Yeah, I'd, I'd kind of set it and forget it. But that's where I learned that you can't always do that. It will stick to itself. I just wasn't as worried. I could just go upstairs, print it out again, and stick it back in the oven. <laughs> um, but yeah, once, so once I do that, you know, get it all shrunk down, get it cut, you know, to the design and the size I want, then, you know, I spray it with, you know, regular fixative. Usually I use a matte fixative. One of the interesting things I found out on one of my pieces, don't touch the fixative it actually pulls the, pay, pulls the ink or the uh, pencil up. If you touch it, it will pull it away from the plastic and stick to your finger. <laughs> I went, oh, crud. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I figured out how to fix it once it's tiny. <laughs> Thankfully, it was a very small spot. So, you know, it's, it's not something people do a lot. And it's not something I can really find a lot of people, you know, there's not like shrink plastic groups on the internet that I could find. So it is very much a process that it, I've kind of learned as I went, you know, what I can do, what I can get away with, what I can't, um, you know, how much cutting I can do, how small the pieces get, you know, and still keep detail. I had, you know, I'd drawn out this really nice little Celtic raven and I was so happy with it and I cut it out and I was like, ah, oh, this is going to be nice, it's going to be like that big. No, it was like that big. <laughs> and I went, well, okay, I'm not going to turn that into a piece. <laughs> So, you know, some of them have turned into like little jewelry things, but. Um, looking at this, um, do you have to, well, or can you, like, um, layer colors, kind of like you do on, um, like, a glass or a clear, where you have to do the, you know, the, the um, closest layer version that you yeah, I, the, the little bit of layering it lets you do, yeah, you have to do it that way. You have to, to think of what's behind. Trying to put too many layers, what the last color you do will pick up the next one. So that's sometimes how I erase. If I have like a black line I put in the wrong spot, I'll take the color that I want to fill it in, I just color over it, and it picks it right up. So yeah, layering is not so easy to do. Um, I haven't played with it too much with different types of paint, particularly. Um, there might be some that it works well with. I think the only thing I've tried paint-wise is I did have a metallic marker that I just wanted to see what it would do, and that kind of ran. So it, it wouldn't 
it wouldn't stay in the lines. It wanted to stay its size. So the plastic shrunk and it stayed the same size. <laughs> so metallic inks, not so good on it. Um, metallic colored pencils though, those shine. Um, the silver, um, I've used Prismacolor, the silver, gold, and the bronze. Um, bronze is bronze, it doesn't really want to shine anyway, but the silver and the gold, they get really sparkly. So they, they take on a really nice sheen and I need to play with that some more. But I actually did that with a little raven, I'd colored in all the feathers in silver and it looked really pretty, it was just tiny. <laughs> uh, Matting and framing wise, because you're pretty much always going to be out to the very edges of what you have, um, you can, you know, you could do a traditional mat and mat right over it, you know, coming in on the edges a little bit. I tend to do what I've done with these, which is the, the kind of floating style, where I'm putting a mat around the outside and then sticking it to another color of mat board as the backing. That way, it, it kind of allows it to be seen all the way to those edges because of the, the sanding and some of that you have to do, even if you're kind of thinking about that and how much of that you need to take off. It's not a predictable medium. <laughs> thinking about how much and you go, okay, well, if I leave you know, an inch on each edge and then I can frame that and without fail, it'll then kind of melt that way or like a little trapezoid or something and you wind up taking more off than you thought you needed to. So I found, you, yeah, I just don't think in that realm. You know, I paint all the way out to the edge but make sure what I want is smack in the middle so I know I'm not sanding any of it off. Um, you know, designs that I've done, most of what I've done are honestly, you know, the Celtic style and I, I like doing furry animals because all of that fur shows up as nice single, it, it looks touchable and fluffy. And you know, working in colored pencil, I like detail. The more detail I can add, the happier I am. So doing something like this where it's almost cheating detail because my lines don't have to be tiny little perfect lines. Once I shrink it, they look like I did tiny little perfect lines. <laughs> so it, it's, it's nice that way. You know, I don't have to think in all those layers, but I have to think about the colors more and how I'm going to put them down and what order and you know, knowing I can't really blend them together. So that's kind of the part that takes a little bit more thought. Um, I've primarily used Prismacolor, wax-based, I have um, some other brands. I honestly have not tried them just because I really like my Prismacolors. <laughs> so they've just kind of sat aside and I thought, ah, I'll do that eventually. So most of what I know in working with it is on the color pencil side of things. Um, I can't think of anything else with that. But yeah, so. So working with this plastic, it, it is fun. It is good for detail. It makes you feel five years old. <laughs> or like you had a five-year-old, you know, when you're little and watching the little shrinky dinks. You know, it's, it's the same principle. Um, I first found this stuff, actually, I was at a, a fandom convention and someone's mom had been there with a toaster oven and was cutting little pieces out and handing it to people and just like, oh, just have fun and play. So I played with it and I was like, I need to get some of this stuff. <laughs> and then the, the company, the only company I've been able to find is Graphics, uh, G-R-A-F-I-X. Um, and you can get them, you used to be able to find them in Michaels all the time. It, it seemed to have had a peak and then dropped off, but you can still find it on their website and order them that way. Um, I bought like five of the little five packs for a little while and then I noticed they had a 50 count pack and I was like, that's mine. <laughs> So I'm still working my way through that one. Uh, but that's the only company I've found that makes it. However, there are other companies that do shrink plastic and really all you have to do is sand it. You know, that's, you know, well this is pre-prepared because I'm kind of lazy and it's nice to just be able to pull it out of the pack and use it. Just spine grade sandpaper, make it rough, it'll take it. So you can change 
you know, I could probably do that with some of the, the colored versions. There are lots of different colors out there now where you just get blank sheets. This is the biggest size I've found. I would love to find you know, oven sized, but then I'm also a little scared on how that would shrink down. <laughs> I need a much larger spatula. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, that's pretty much the, the extent of the shrink plastic, so. Um, when you said that, the, the, as you know, sometimes it, it comes out like a trapezoid. Now, does that mean your image can sometimes come out? Um, a little bit. You can get some shift. So if you're needing something with strict, straight squares and things like that, don't work with this stuff. It will shift it sometimes just a little bit, just the natural variations in the plastic. That can occur. So, like when you do like your Celtic knots, like you want a circle and it ends up kind of not being quite. If it ends up being enough that I look at it and go, oh, that's going to bug me every time I look at it, I'll do it over again. Yeah, because sometimes one piece of plastic will do it, the next one won't. I I haven't found a good reason for that yet. Um, there's some tricks of like putting them between uh, two pieces of cardboard. I usually, I'll put this on a piece of cardboard in the oven because the temperature isn't high enough to affect the cardboard, but it gives me something that cools down pretty quickly. Um, I haven't tried that yet just because I've been a little afraid that as it cools, that other piece of cardboard is going to stick to the ink or the pencil. It doesn't. No, it, it, well, it does maybe just a touch, but as soon as it's dry, I just bend the cardboard a little bit and it pops right up. Now, the sanded part, is that the... When you put it in, do you put the sanded part facing up or the sanded part? Yes, sanded part facing up. Yeah, and you can see it has a, a smooth and a sanded. I haven't played with it, but I've thought about you know, trying like some you know, almost stained glass type work because it's so translucent. Um, I just haven't played with that yet. It's been in the, on the, to -do, the mental to-do list, which you know is <laughs> variable depending on what you're doing at the moment. <laughs> so are you drawing? You're putting the color on the sand part. Correct. So you said you found it for uh, inkjet. So you would print it on the sand part. Actually, that's a specific type. They make two types. They do. Yep. Or th actually, three. They make just regular, plain, you know, you can use like markers on it. They make the sanded type that you can use the color pencil or other types of medium on. And then they make an inkjet. And the inkjet. It's not really rough, but it's not really smooth either. It's almost, it's not really sanded either. I, I don't know exactly how to describe it. It's just vaguely bumpy. <laughs> so it's, it's a different type. You could probably sand that stuff too and do the same thing though. I have to try it because I do photography and I love the way the bird looks. But mm. I thought, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another way to do photography. <laughs> Yeah, that would, that would be interesting. Yeah, they, um, I know they don't, or at least I haven't found an inkjet that was really a good clear one. They, they'd say it's clear, but it almost always comes out kind of a milky white color. So. Oh, but when it's baked? Yeah, once it's baked, it always seems to have just a little bit of a milkiness That's to fine. it. Yeah, you, you play with it. I mean, that's. Yeah, but I have a printer that I can do up to an eight by 10 picture. Okay, perfect. yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kids' toys, <laughs> so play. <laughs> so if you um, wanted to, like, attach to something and you put, like, you needed a hole in it or something like that, do you do that before or after? Generally before. Um, it's going to be a heck of a lot easier to put a hole in it before. After, you can use a drill but realize it's plastic. If you get that drill going fast enough, it will melt and then it will stick to the drill. <laughs> and then it can be a lot more difficult. So it, it's definitely a lot easier. Um, a standard hole, hole punch, just a regular hole punch, puts a hole big enough that you can put like an earring finder through once it's baked. So it shrinks the hole too. But yeah, if you want to make necklace pieces, um, you know, earrings, all sorts of things you can do with it you know, cutting it out and doing it in different things. But yeah, you want to put the hole in first.
Any other questions? Do you do commission work? I do, yes. Yeah, more in watercolors and stuff? Um, mostly, more and more, I actually do more and more colored pencil versus the watercolor. I will still sometimes use watercolor as a background for some things like, um, like my wolfhound here. Um, you know, doing that just to fill in the background and then using the colored pencil as detail. Pretty much, you know, I'm not even going to say pretty much, all of my pet portraits I do in colored pencil because of the fur. I can, I can get that fine fur detail. Um, you know, as much as do you draw? Um, I use the Canson Metianus pastel paper. I like it because it has all the colors, and that's one of my favorites. Otherwise, I do have some uh, suede board, the suede matte board, and I'll use pencil on that as well because you get kind of a really nice soft appearance to it. I've done some cats with that because long-haired cats and suede board go together really nicely. <laughs> Um, otherwise, some Bristol paper here and there, uh, the vellum, but not commonly. I have some watercolor paper I've done things on. Honestly, I have a drawer of paper, and I think of an idea, and then I go into the drawer and go, uh, yeah, that one looks good. <laughs> Questions about this? Sure. So, uh, why does it see the same thing effect? Even everything shrinks. So you'll see all the sand marks as well as the... Is that brown how? I'm sorry? Why did the sanding marks show darker than the background? Or is this something you... I mean, this is cream colored and light brown. Oh, that's, that's actually the pencil. I, I penciled... Yep, I did the pencil in the background, trying to make it look kind of like an aged paper. Okay. You know, I, and that was... I was also playing with the blending. Correct. Yeah. Okay. If I were... If you didn't put that on there and just drew it, would it then be just clear? Clear-ish. It'd almost be like a frosted glass. Frosted. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it winds up looking kind of a frosted glass. I, I did do... Um, I did an orca and a, a salmon piece, and I left the background so I could put different colors behind it. And yeah, it winds up with kind of a sanded, soft glass appearance. <coughs> do you make your own mats or do you buy them? I, I buy them. Yep. Uh, either there is a, um, well, it used to be Wing and Pond, now it's paint and something in paint. There, there's a little gallery that's like two blocks from my house. So they know me well. I'll go in, I'll go through some of their pre-made ones and I'll just pull out a bunch of them. Or if I have a specific piece, you know, I'll go in, especially on my odd sizes, I'll pick those out. I technically have a mat cutter, but actually somebody else has my mat cutter because I have nowhere to put it. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, mom doesn't have the mat cutter, actually. Mom gave me the mat cutter. And I let somebody who cuts mats have it for now because I, yeah. Yep, and he cuts mats for both of us. <laughs> it was a good deal. I don't have to have it in the house where I don't know what to do with it. He gets to use it. <laughs> so how old were you when you started dabbling? Uh, were you little, little? Dabbling, yes, because mom would give me pencils and paper and go just keep busy. <laughs> right, yep. Yeah, I, I can remember going to Blennerhassett Island in Parker's, or just out in the river in Parkersburg and you know, she'd have a little setup with her artwork and I'd have my own little thing in the back where I'm just doing painting and, and whatnot and putting those together and feeling like I'm professional. <laughs> Selling, yeah, doing pro truly professionally maybe 20 years. Thereabouts, where I've actually been selling it. I kind of started in, in college. So did you, did you go to school to be a vet, or did you go to school to be an artist first? I went to school to be a vet. All of my, all of my education, formal education, has been uh, animal science and, and veterinary medicine. And this is a, just the task with it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of joke, I, I went to vet school to afford to do artwork. I do artwork so that I mentally can go to the vet school, the vet clinic, and you know, it works both sides of my brain, and I kind of like that. So. <laughs> did you take college art courses? Nope, I did not actually. So it's Any art courses? <laughs> High school. Are, are you just born with it? <laughs> <laughs> I can't draw no. straight lines, put it that way, so. <laughs> she has a mask. Look like 
like a straight line. <laughs> Right, yeah, none of, the, none of these are straight. They loop around. That's, that's the whole point for card work. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I took high school art classes and I, I, in junior high, uh, and I had you know, good teachers there. But most of what I've done has been just repetitive practice and watching other people and kind of learning as I go. Yeah, no, Thank you. Can you talk about those first three pieces? Sure. Like what medium they are? Yeah. Yeah, um, so this is, this is actually Lexi. Um, she was the uh, pet portrait done for actually one of my receptionists at the clinic. And that one is all in color pencil. This is actually technically a print of it. Well, not technically, it is a print of the original since they have the original. But by the nature of pet portraits, they're <laughs> you give them away. So I framed this one so that I could bring it around and show, yeah, I, I do do that. Um, but yeah, the original is all in colored pencil on, I want to say this, it's sand colored Canson Metianus paper. Uh, and I really like the sand. It has, and similar ones for Canson, it has almost like a little felting effect to it. So when you draw on it, it becomes that almost blurry black background that really lets what you're doing pop forward quite a bit. So it's one of my favorites to work on. Um, this one. Uh, Scriptus Rex is watercolor background and then I did color pencil on all the, the details. It's on a piece of mat board. Um, this one started, I was sitting at a convention and super bored because nobody was there. So I just started drawing him out um, and playing with the knot work. The, the Latin is from the Book of Kells, the Irish illuminated manuscript and it's, I write the words of the king. So I had to put a monk in there. So it's Irish wolfhound monk. A uh, few years after I did it, I had somebody come up and tell me I spelled it wrong. And I was like, really? And then we both looked at the same page, because I, I went directly to the page and I like, copied it down. Apparently the original monk spelled it wrong. <laughs> it's supposed to be an M, not an N. I was informed by a Latin scholar, so I was like, OK, I will believe you. Um, this is colored pencil on, I think this is actually Artigan paper that I did this particular one on. Um, I have a friend of mine that has a, a laser cutter, so she cuts the frames, the wooden frames for me. I did the design and, and what I wanted. I have little round ones, little square ones. I've used most of them up and I need to tell her to cut me some more now. Um, they're a bit of a challenge though, because I mean you guys, you can all come up and look at this stuff closer. Um, but the wood itself is a quarter of an inch. And I have a local glass company then cut glass circles that fit in there. And I use epoxy resin. And I epoxy over it to keep the glass in there. Um, otherwise, I don't have a really good way of keeping <laughs> glass and everything together in that size. Um, so that was a bit of a learning experience to figure out how to put that all together. Um, this one, uh, Arctic, I, I have a lot of fun with names of my pieces, so this is Arctic Circle. <laughs> um, pretty much all of my round pieces have some joke with them in the name, so I have one that I did of, loop, of wolves, and that's Loop to Loop. I have three colors of the Labradors, Labyrinth. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of some of the others that I did, but yeah, they're, they're almost all jokes, if I can get it. That's what I get from my dad. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the science side of things too, but you know, sense of humor predominantly. <laughs> um, yeah, like I say, you're, you're welcome to come up, look at them more closely. Um, you know, I, I tell people they're, they're touchable and look throughable, so you know, feel free to pick up you know, even the, the piece that I'm working on there. It's hard to damage this stuff. And if you do, I'm not going to be. I'm, I'm not going to beat you. I promise. I can take the other piece and redraw it. <laughs> I want to thank you, Emily. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>